What better way to start the summer than to cover my first laptop on the channel? I picked up Microsoft's Ultrabook a couple months after its release in October 2018. Me and the Surface Laptop 2 have had a fair share of ups and downs, so I thought, you know the drill, I'm gonna wrap it all up in a long term review, and I might just throw in a quick Windows 11 breakdown as well, for all you curious people wondering. So go grab some food or something, kick back, and enjoy. I'd usually start off with the screen, but since the design of this thing is easily its standout piece, let's get into that first. It certainly is one to look at, and with pretty much all other Surface products, it's put together seriously well too. Yeah, you may be saying it looks kinda sharp against something like a MacBook, but I honestly love this design. The screen's very slim, and a bit flimsy, but the hinge is near spot on in terms of stiffness. There's a clear wedge shape towards the front of the laptop, which isn't good for port placement, but balances the weight surprisingly well actually. And speaking of weight, since it's basically two unibody bits of aluminium, the i5 variant weighs just 1.25 kilos, with the i7 adding about 30 grams, so it's definitely very portable. When it comes to the Alcantara, not gonna lie, I didn't know how well an Alcantara keyboard would hold up over two years, but surprisingly, I haven't got any stains or marks so far, which some people have. I also noticed that the finish does catch a ton of fingerprints from certain angles, but they are pretty easy to wipe off, same with any little scratches. Finally, you'll be getting a glass trackpad which supports four finger gestures and multi-touch. Granted, it's smooth and has a very satisfying click, but I'll still be using a mouse with this laptop. There's not a whole lot of crazy stuff to say about the screen for this one. It's a 13.5 inch diagonal IPS LCD with a resolution of 2256 by 1504, which you eagle-eyed viewers will notice gives it a 3x2 aspect ratio. Using this for me took a bit of getting used to, but after a while, you kind of just forget about it. On a side note, it's a touch screen, which is useful maybe that 10% of the time that you'll be gaming, or it's just easier to use, but I mostly forgot about it. The screen is noticeably sharp, especially if you're coming from like a 720 or even a 1080p display, which I did. The viewing angles are awesome, although the peak brightness isn't quite there if you're in harsh sunlight, but it does get very very dim, which is quite impressive. The bezels are nice and uniform around the top and the sides, but the chin sometimes sticks out like a sore thumb with a light wallpaper. Obviously though, you can just change that. Overall though, videos and media in particular are going to look absolutely fine, even if sometimes you've got to sacrifice for black bars on videos, but... That's not a major thing for me, I'm quite happy with this screen. It's keyboard time, luckily for the right reasons. Microsoft gave us a cracking keyboard this time round, both in terms of layout and feel of the subtler things like the keys themselves and their travel. For sure everything here just feels well laid out and like someone really considered it. The keys are smooth and going back to any other laptop keyboard feels kinda dull since I love the comfort of the Alcantara and the general spacing used here. Long typing or editing sessions on the keyboard are fairly comfortable as everything is somewhat reachable and the volume, brightness and power keys are part of the layout as well. The backlight toggle also has three different levels to cycle through and gets nicely bright if you're in a very dim scenario. And yes, though this isn't really intended as a gaming rig, the light testing I've done with it on a couple titles proves it shouldn't suffer any feedback issues whilst you're playing. All I'm saying is, if you wanna, you can run games alright, but this thing isn't really made with say, Forza or Apex in mind, etc. There's a number of different CPU configurations, including a Core M3, i5, or i7. They all have Intel's UHD Graphics 620 GPU, and the M3 comes with 4 gigs of RAM out of the box, where the other two chips net you 8 or 16 gigs, depending on price. You also get anywhere from a 128 gig to a 1 terabyte SSD, although they get pretty expensive pretty quickly, so just watch out. I went for the i5 model with 8 gigs of RAM and the 128 gig SSD. Looking back, I definitely would have gone for more storage, but I'm glad at least that the RAM is enough to juggle my day-to-day -day usage. As a package, it adds up to solid but not quite stellar performance in my opinion for most day-to-day -day bits, and I'll go into how it runs on Windows 11 a bit later on, but long story short, it's fast enough after a couple years that you won't feel the need to upgrade. Although at this price, I don't think people really want to be paying for replacements anytime soon. On to the fans, and they actually really surprised me. They're nicely tucked away under the hinge and are pretty much silent under load at full speed. Just take a listen. Nonetheless, I found the bass still heats up quite a bit, but it's only really severe with 3D games and intensive programs like editing software, a bit of Photoshop, stuff like that will stress the CPU and the GPU a little bit, but honestly, it should be fine. Also, in case you're wondering, these are the scores I got for Geekbench 4 after a couple runs, which are actually quite a bit lower than the same benchmark I ran a while ago on Windows 10. There's not a huge difference, but I just thought I'd put them in anyway. 
Finally, we've got the Surface Laptop 2 mics and video quality. Let me know how the mics sound, let me know how the video looks. It's a bit potato, but mm, I actually used to use these as my main mics for recording the audio for my videos. So, you know, let that be a staple of how good they used to be versus how tinny they sound now. I don't know what happened. Microsoft just kind of <laughs> ruined the mics a little bit. But yeah, if you're doing a bit of light teams, a bit of light zoom, these will be fine, but don't expect much. It's not great. At the opposite end of the scale lies the Windows Hello Face Unlocking, which works in any lighting, is snappy and secure, and above all, it just makes sense in terms of placement and just how much time you save in general needing just one swipe. Lastly, you got the stereo speakers, which pack an impressive level of clarity, especially being underneath the keyboard. They get quite loud and full sounding if you whack them up, but do lack a bit of bass, I guess, having only so much space inside the chassis. My main gripe is more the level of rattle you get above 50% volume on certain songs. Likely another hardware constraint, but still a bit annoying, although it's on and off depending on what you're listening to. To demonstrate, it's at its worst on S13's next up. Again though, no, nothing major. I should have mentioned the laptop's port situation earlier, but in short, it's a USB-A, mini display port and a headphone jack, thank god, on the left. For me, having a single USB port is a pain in the backside, although the SL2 can just about make this trade off being so damn thin. I haven't used the mini display port even once, so honestly I would have liked to see a USB-C or even just another full size USB port crammed in there instead. On the right side, you get Microsoft's satisfying magnetic charging port to fit their proprietary connector. It's held in by just those magnets, so if you ever knock the cable it just snaps out and right back in again, no hassle. The charger is a 44 watt power brick and comes with an extra USB port on the side to charge one other device. I won't go into it too much, but my charging speeds from about 5% to full are quite varied. I usually just leave it a couple hours as the battery gauge gets stuck on 99% and takes a while to reach the full 100. And since we're on the topic of charging, I might as well talk about battery life. Oh boy. So when this thing came out, Microsoft claimed up to about 15 hours of endurance. And let's be honest, you'd have to barely touch Word documents to get that figure. A few months after I got this laptop, I'd get maybe 5, 6 or 7 hours screen on time. And then I installed a Windows update, and I was scraping <laughs> 3 hours of light usage. Since then, I tried a bunch of different methods to fix it, all of which did nothing. So it's safe to say that after a year, I just stopped trying. And of course, Microsoft didn't even bother to fix it. Nowadays, using mainly Microsoft Edge, watching YouTube, typing up occasional Word documents here and there, leaving Spotify open a lot, seems to get a decent amount of battery, maybe four and a bit hours to put a number on it. Luckily, a little longer than the joke worthy stuff of Windows 10. So yeah, battery life and endurance, definitely it's Achilles heel. Although if you don't really care, then it's insignificant. I leave mine plugged in most of the time for anything power hungry anyway. To save a couple points back, I got no complaints about standby time, even with tasks still running, and it's alright overnight. But I have read forums about people complaining about standby time as well. All that being said though, I'll have to see how it runs with the latest Windows betas. Last but not least, thought I'd come back to Windows 11, as I promised. So I must start off by saying that I was genuinely shocked at how well this ran for a properly early release like this. Everything feels like 95% polished and I know some people don't like the new feel of the UI but I started to love it almost instantly. It runs buttery smooth in some areas but definitely does need some refinement but this is still damn right impressive for a beta. Things I liked in particular were the new theming section that lets you change everything to a new preset look and the taskbar's new layout. I used to use Taskbar X on Windows 10, which centers the icons, but this launches the start menu straight from the center, or you can change it back to the left. But I just kept it the center, obviously, it's a new thing, I'm gonna go with it. Plus, our Wi Fi, sound, and battery icons are all this single block now, with the date and time shrunken down a bit from before. The new flyouts are also much appreciated, looking super clean with the rounded corners and a more Android like look to them. It's not for everyone, but personally, I love it. 
And if you're wondering, I use a store app called Modern Flyouts for my volume and brightness controls. This isn't the standard, it's, uh, it's still the one from Windows 10. You might not mind it. Most of the apps by now are optimized for the rounded corners, although a couple, such as Spotify and, at the time of this video, Outlook, don't yet, but they should be in the future. You've also got new, more fluid animations for snapping windows and a multitasking panel in the top right corner which includes some different panel layouts. If I'm being completely honest, the only thing that bugs me is the new lock screen layout since I prefer the clock in the bottom corner in Windows 10. In a nutshell though, I think Windows 11 is going to be great, especially on the Surface line of products, and hopefully the performance here is promising enough for how it will run on the final release. So there you have it. Not only my longest video yet, but if you've made it to the end, <laughs> thanks a lot for watching and please subscribe, like and all that, share this around etc and stay tuned and I'll see you in a bit.